Shalom Aleichem, Boker Tov. It's Mikhail here today on uh, May 20th. This is uh, 2014 and ER 20, 59.99. Going to get into the 144,000 today of Revelation 7. So let's go ahead and without any further ado, go ahead and enter into a spirit of prayer. So we can go ahead and get into this particular chapter so hallelujah hallelujah and hallelujah blessed are you ya almighty one king of the universe the elohim of abraham yitzhak and yaakov creator of heaven earth sea and all that is in them i we give you thanks for allowing us to once again be blessed to come back into the land of the living and to receive your breath of life for causing us to lie down in peace as well as to rise up in peace heavenly father for moving sleep from our eyes and slumber from our eyelids. We give you praise and ask that you pardon us, Heavenly Father, for any sin that we have committed against you, that you cause us to stand before you naked and unashamed, and that you also open our eyes to the wonders of your Torah so we may enter into your word, Heavenly Father, and uh, provide us with understanding. Oh, and please, Abba Yah, we ask that you allow our hearts to be established in your word and our steps to be ordered according to that as well. We ask for insight, we ask for revelation, and we ask, Heavenly Father, most importantly, for application and a willing heart to serve you in all these matters. We pray these things in the name of our high priest and king, our rabbi, our redeemer, our prophet, our bridegroom, our Mashiach, who is Yahushua, Baruch Hashem, Hallelujah, and Amen. So we're going to get right into this particular chapter of Revelation. We have here... A matter of numbers. We're going to look at some numbers and the symbolism of the numbers. There's a lot of uh, figurative language and flowery language in this matter uh, that we've read even up into this chapter uh, that we have to understand. And again, this is you know, it is a twofold genre book. It is a an apocalyptic genre as well as a prophetic genre. So to understand this book again, we have to understand it through the literary devices that are used in apocalyptic language as well as in uh, prophetic vision okay so this is a matter that we had talked about before yachanan is seeing a lot of these matters in spirit okay he was he came to be in the spirit on that day it says and uh, it's the same language ezekiel uses the same language isaiah uses same language Zechariah uses, same language Daniel uses. So we have to look at it through this particular matter to understand it in further detail. But this chapter in Revelation 7, it has with it 17 verses, so we're going to break it down in half. Uh, we're going to read the first uh, eight verses, and then we're going to come back and read the latter nine verses. It reads as follows. And after this, I saw four messengers standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another messenger coming up from the rising of the sun, holding the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a loud voice to the four messengers to whom it was given to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our Elohim upon their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Yehuda, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reubim, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed of the tribe of Menashe, 12,000 were sealed of the tribe of Shimon, 12,000 were sealed of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed of the tribe of Yisaskar, 12,000 were sealed of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed of the tribe of Yosef, 12,000 were sealed of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Selah. So, we're going to start and looking at these four messengers, okay? These four messengers are very important, and uh, they are symbolic of the archangels, 
of heaven. Uh, what we want to do in uh, looking at this initially, we want to look to the book I have a couple of places that I'm looking at. Okay. So these four great messengers. That we're going to look at. very important role and that these are the ones who are to seal up the angels and so let's do this so we're just going to go to the book of Enoch first chapter 18 we're going to look at the first <clears throat> five verses this is the book of Enoch the Ethiopian Ethiopic book of Enoch sometimes we got to go beyond the script and look at what others said as well now these books are referenced to in the scripture this is actually a book with the first chapter is quoted in the book of Yehuda or the book of Jude. This book is quoted from, so it lets you know this book was read, it was referenced, <laughs> it is in use, okay? So let's look at this, chapter 18, 1 through 5. It says this, it says, I then surveyed the receptacles of all the winds, perceiving that in them were the ornaments of the whole creation, and to preserve the foundations of the earth. I surveyed the stone which supports the corners of the earth, and of course that is Mashiach. I also beheld the four winds which bear up the earth and the firmament of heaven. And I beheld the winds occupying the height of heaven, arising in the midst of heaven and of earth, and constituting the pillars of heaven. So these four messengers are the ones holding up these matters and holding these um, winds up. Okay, they are the ones who are controlling the winds. Of course, you have the four cardinal directions, north, east, south, and west. And these messengers are placed in those directions to address the matter. Now, when you go back and you read the four horsemen, very interesting uh, matter. You're dealing with a lot of numerics. As a matter of fact, um, when you're looking at this particular matter, um, this is a matter of uh, completion. Okay, um, but four is a number that is dealing with, uh, let's see, I believe it deals with uh, justice and righteousness, and so this is being established, and I will confirm that um, shortly and, and make a, a note. Um, here it is. It's a divine number um, of four. Um, four. So that is a very important number. So I'm going to read this real quick. It says apocalyptic text regarded numbers as based in heaven um, these were uh, intrinsically linked to the father's own perfection Enoch's tours of the cosmos revealed four very different regions of heavenly activity and Ezekiel beheld four living creatures surrounding the father's throne while many texts presume four principal archangels and seven or twelve heavens the periodizations of history that some apocalypses offer to explain the alteration of fortune and misfortune in Israelite experience usually unrolled according to some perfect number 490, which is 7 times 70, or 14, 12 plus 1 plus 1. But by the second century, some believers envisioned their four most popular gospels as expressing the perfection of the divine number four, <clears throat> even connecting them to Ezekiel's four living creatures. So Revelation is especially interested in the unfolding potentiality of the number seven as the Father's heavenly number. Now, we're not going to really get into that, but we're going to see 
this chapter unfold, but these numbers have a very significant matter. Okay, so when we look at that, we also want to look at Ezekiel 37. Uh, so we just read about these four winds, which are establishing and constituting the, the holding up of the firmament of earth and heaven. Okay, but we're going to go to Ezekiel 37 right now. And we're going to look at the first 10 verses of Ezekiel, which reads as follows. Well, let's just go to the verse 9 and 10. This is regarding the, the, the dry bones in the valley. He said to me, prophesy to the spirit, son of man, prophesy, and you shall say to the spirit, thus said the master, Yah, come from the four winds, O spirit, and breathe on these killed ones so that they live. And I prophesied. As he commanded me, and the spirit came into them, and they stood, lived, and they lived and stood upon their feet, a very great army. And this will come back again. We will come back to that. Let's also look at Daniel 7. We're going to look at Daniel 7, verses 1 through 3, which reads as follows. It says, In the first year of Belshazzar, sovereign of Babel, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head on his bed. So again, this is a vision in his head, not a literal sight that he saw. Then he wrote down the dream, giving a summary of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I was looking in my vision by night and saw the four winds of the heavens stirring up the great sea. And four beasts came up from the sea, different from one another. So these four winds have a very uh, interesting um, role in that they are usually pregnant when some type of force that will ensue after them, either some force of order or some force of chaos. Right now, we're looking at a preservation in order to bring forth a chaos, a judgment rather. Okay, and uh, we're going to go to the root of that after a couple of verses as well. Now, let's go to Zechariah 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> Which reads as follows, I lifted up my eyes and looked and saw a man with a measuring line in his hand. And he said, and I said, where are you going? And he said to me to measure Yerushalayim to see what is its width and what is its length. And see the messenger who was speaking to me was going out and another messenger was coming out to meet him. So, you know, you're seeing these messengers again. <clears throat> and he said to me, run, speak to this young man saying Yerushalayim is to remain unwalled because of the many men and livestock in it. For I myself am to her, declares Yah, a wall of fire all around, and for esteem I am in her midst. And we'll get to that too. Oh, oh, and flee from the land of the north, declares Yah, for I have scattered you like the four winds of the heavens, declares Yah, O Zion. Escape, you who dwell with the daughter of Babel. So here we have these four winds mentioned as a scattering, but now it is telling us to escape. It is telling the children of Israel to escape, to escape from the land of Babel, okay? Because what is coming to it? These four winds have been stirred up, and now they're coming to bring this judgment, this wrath upon the four corners of the earth and to escape from the judgments that are to come. Okay, now we're going to look at Matthew 24, and we're going to look at verses 27 through 30. It reads as follows. For as the lightning comes from east and shines to the west, so also shall the coming of the son of Adam be. For wherever the dead body is, there the vultures shall be gathered together. And immediately after the distress of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give its light and the stars shall fall from heaven. We just read this in the last chapter. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then the sign of the son of Adam shall appear in the heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. And they shall see the son of Adam coming on the clouds of the heaven with power and much esteem. And he shall send his messengers with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his chosen ones from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. Okay, these four winds, he shall gather them from these four winds. Okay, these are each of the directions. But we have to understand this wind first finds its appearance in Genesis 1. When you look at chapter 1, verse 2, it says, And the earth came to be formless and empty, 
and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the spirit of Elohim was moving on the face of the earth. That word wind is akin to the word ruach, spirit. So these four spirits, you can call them, is very akin to the four to the spirit of Elohim moving over the face of the waters, which is the impregnating force to give birth to some sort of reality. That was the initial sign that something was about to catalyze and to come into shape. Okay, so now this is the same thing. These messengers are at the four corners of the earth holding back these four winds. Okay, to not blow on anything until his servants are sealed. Okay, so we look at verse 2. And you see these messengers, another messenger coming, a fifth messenger coming from the east, okay? Coming from the east, holding the seal of the living Elohim. Well, here's the question. What's the seal of the living Elohim? If you look up the word seal and what it means in the dictionary, you will find as it relates to a king, and we talked about this in one of the lessons, the mark of the beast, that it deals with his name, it deals with his authority, and it deals with his jurisdiction, okay? His identity, his authority as far as how he came to power, what is his reason for ruling, and then what his jurisdiction is. Well, the father's seal is no different because he has something that identifies him and it also demonstrates his authority and it shows what his jurisdiction is. And we're going to look at that in the 20th chapter of Exodus. We're going to read the 8th through the 11th verse and it reads as follows it says remember the sabbath day this is the seventh day sabbath from sundown of the sixth day which we is known in the gregorian calendar as friday to sundown of the seventh day which in the gregorian calendar is called saturday remember the sabbath day to set it apart six days you labor and shall do all your work but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yah, your Elohim. You do not do any work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days, Yahuwah, Yahuwah, Yah, yad he -he, that is his identity, okay? He made his authority. He is the creator. He made, what is his jurisdiction? He made the heavens, the earth the sea and all that is in them so he's sovereign over all those realities and he rested the seventh day therefore yah blessed the sabbath day and set it apart so what are you saying i'm saying this is the seal of the living elohim his sabbath okay observing his word will cause you to be sealed okay and we're going to look at this in another light we're going to go to ezekiel 20 and we're going to see how this relates to what Ezekiel says. Ezekiel 20. We're going to start at verse 11 and go through verse 20. It says, And I gave them my laws and showed them my right rulings, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And I also gave them my Sabbaths, plural, my Sabbaths. These are his feast days, his holy days. To be a sign, which is another word for a seal, between me and them to know that I am Yah who sets them apart. But they, the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my laws and they rejected my right rulings, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly profaned my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my wrath on them in the wilderness to consume them. So when you see that they are not keeping, Israel has not kept their Sabbaths. That's when the wrath burned against them, okay? Let's see. But I acted for my namesake, not to profane it before the nations, before whose eyes I had brought them out. And I myself also lifted my hand in an oath to them in the wilderness, not to give, not to bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, the splendor of all lands, because they rejected my right rulings and did not walk in my laws, and they profaned my Sabbaths. For their heart went after their idols, and my eye parted them from destroying them. And I did not make an end of them in the wilderness. And I said to their children in, wild, in the wilderness, Do not walk in the laws of your fathers, nor observe their rulings, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am Yah, your Elohim, walk in my laws, and guard my right rulings, and do them. And set apart my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you to know that I am Yah, your Elohim. So here it is. The Sabbath is the sign and the seal 
and the mark along with obeying his laws. When you are doing what the Father commands you to do, he will make a distinction between you and the rest of the nation, which is demonstrated most clearly in the 11th chapter of Exodus, which we're going to go to and see how Yah sealed and signed these people. We're going to read the 4th through the 7th verse. This is the last plague, okay, of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. He reads as follows. And Moshe said, Thus said Yah, about midnight I am going out into the midst of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim shall die, and the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of cattle. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Mithraim, such as has never been or ever shall be again. But against any of the children of Israel, no dog shall move its tongue against man or against beast, so that you know that Yah makes distinction between Mithraim and Israel. Now, what set them apart in Mithraim? Their obedience. Okay, They kept his word. They observed his feast day, his Pesach, which was when that last plague took place. And because of that Sabbath, that seal that was upon them allowed it to pass over. Judgment passed over them. And Yah made a distinction between Israel and between Mitzrayim, which is the same thing that is going to take place in Revelation 7 that we're reading right now. This harming of the earth, the trees, and the sea will not fall upon the children of Israel who are obedient and are sealed with the Father's signs. Okay. So we read there um, that matter. And we're going to now go into um, verse 3 and says, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our Elohim upon their foreheads. Very important point. But let's go and look at something prior to that. Let's look at Exodus chapter, I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 9. We're going to look at the first six verses. Ezekiel 9, first six verses. And he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let the punishers of the city draw near each with his weapon of destruction in his hand. And look, six men from the direction of the upper gate with faces north, excuse me, each with his battle axe in his hand, and one man in their midst was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. And they came in and stood beside the bronze slaughter place, and the esteem of the Elohim of Israel went up from the cherub or the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the writer's inkhorn at his side, ink horn at his side. And Yah said to him, Pass on into the midst of the city, into the midst of Yerushalayim, and you shall put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. And to the others he said in my hearing, Pass on into the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye pardon nor spare. Kill to destruction old, young men, maidens, and children, and women, but do not come near anyone upon whom is the mark and begin at my set apart place. So they began with the elders who were in the front of the house. Mark on the forehead. OK, this is your thoughts. Your forehead symbolizes your thoughts. This is why when you read in Revelation 13, we'll get to later. The mark of the beach is in your forehead and on your hand. Your thoughts and your actions are intimately tied to this beast. Same thing with the father, but he wants your heart, your thoughts first. The lev, the word lev, heart, it also refers to the seat of your intellect, your thoughts, okay? So Yah wants your thoughts to be secured and centered on him initially, which is why he marks that first so that, that then your actions carry out in accordance with what you're thinking, okay? So now we hear this number of those who are sealed in verse uh, 4 of Revelation 7. And you have 144,000 men. We're going to now go to another apocalyptic book. This is also from the um, the new annotated, the Oxford annotated Apocrypha. Okay, this is the Apocrypha. These are hidden books. But we're going to look at 2nd Ezra. We're going to go to the second chapter. And we're going to look at the 33rd through the 41st verse and read as follows. I, Ezra, received a command from the Most High on Mount Horeb to go to Israel. Interesting. He goes to Israel. When I came to them, they rejected me and refused Yah's commandment. Therefore, I say unto you, O nations, that hear and understand, await your shepherd. He will give you everlasting rest because he will come. He who will come at the end of the age is close at hand. Be ready for the rewards of the kingdom 
because the eternal light will shine upon you forevermore. Flee from the shadow of this age. Receive the joy of your esteem. I publicly call on my Savior to witness. Receive what Yah has entrusted to you and be joyful, giving thanks to him who has called you to heavenly kingdoms. Rise and stand and see at the feast of Yah. Now here it is again. This is one of the Sabbaths. See at the feast of Yah. The number of those who have been sealed. And we're going to get to that. 144,000. Those who have departed from the shadow of this age and, and have received esteemed garments from the Most High. Take again your full number, O Zion, and conclude the list of your people who are clothed in white, who have fulfilled the law of Yah. There it is again. They have fulfilled the law. The number of your children whom you desired is full. Beseech Yah's power that your people who have been called from the beginning may be made set apart or holy. So this lets you know those who are keeping the commandments which sanctify, sanctifies them when you observe and fulfill a commandment is what will bring them into this number and into this kingdom. Okay. Now <clears throat> we're going to look at Ezekiel 37. These are very prophetic books. Same genre, same spirit. We're going to look at the 15th through the 17th verse, verses of this matter. Ezekiel 37, 15, it says this. Well, we'll get to that shortly. We'll get to that. Let's go to 1 Chronicles 27, because Yah has always ordered his nation. Okay, this is 1 Chronicles 27, and 1. It says, And the children of Israel, according to their number, the heads of the father's houses and the commanders of thousands and hundreds and their officers served the sovereign in all matters of the divisions which came in and went out new moon by new moon throughout all the new moons of the year, each division having 24,000. So 12 divisions, 24,288,000. Mm -hmm. So this is one half of that 288,000 that will be, we'll read that latter 144,000 in the 14th chapter of Revelation. And we talked about this in the Techiet Hamatim teaching, which is there will be 288,000 chosen from the barley and the wheat harvest. This is the wheat harvest. Let's make that clear and understand that matter there. Um, so when you see um, through the seventh chapter, they describe all those 12 tribes of Israel. Notice that Dan, uh, the tribe of Dan and the tribe of Ephraim are not mentioned in these two, in these um, 12 tribes that are identified. So let's be clear first and foremost, the 144,000 is composed of none other than the children of Israel, regathered from the four corners of the earth. Okay, this is not inclusive of Gentiles right here. This is not inclusive of Christians right here. This is Israel specific. Okay, 12,000 um, from each of the tribes. Okay, this is specific to Israel. No one else has that particular matter. This is only Israel that will be accounted in that particular number of the wheat harvest, 144,000. There will be a gathering of Gentiles in a latter number, okay, that we're going to read in this next particular passage. So let's go ahead and um, I'm going to pause on this note here, and then we're going to come back and do part two and read the latter. So we'll just part one, part two this, okay? Here we go. Part one coming to an end. <laughs> 